Political aspects of Islam are derived from the Quran, the Sunnah, the sayings and living habits of Muhammad, Muslim history, and elements of political movements outside Islam. Traditional political concepts in Islam include leadership by elected or selected successors to the Prophet known as caliphs, imamate for Shia, the importance of following Islamic law or sharia, the duty of rulers to seek shura or consultation from their subjects, and the importance of rebuking unjust rulers. A significant change in the Islamic world was the abolition of the Ottoman Caliphate in 1924. In the 19th and 20th century, common Islamic political theme has been resistance to Western imperialism and enforcement of sharia through democratic or militant struggle. The defeat of Arab armies in the Six-Day War, the end of Cold War and collapse of the Soviet Union with the end of communism as a viable alternative has increased the appeal of Islamic movements such as Islamism, Islamic fundamentalism and Islamic democracy, especially in the context of popular dissatisfaction with secularist ruling regimes in the Muslim world. Introduction Origins of Islam as a political movement are to be found in the life and times of Islam's prophet Muhammad and his successors. In 622 CE, in recognition of his claims to prophethood, Muhammad was invited to rule the city of Medina. At the time the local Arab tribes of Aus and Khazraj dominated the city, and were in constant conflict. Medinans saw in Muhammad an impartial outsider who could resolve the conflict. Muhammad and his followers thus moved to Medina, where Muhammad drafted the Medina Charter. This document made Muhammad the ruler, and recognized him as the Prophet of Allah. The laws Muhammad established during his rule, based on the revelations of the Quran and doing of Muhammad, are considered by Muslims to be sharia or Islamic law, which Islamic movements seek to establish in the present day. Muhammad gained a widespread following and an army, and his rule expanded first to the city of Mecca and then spread through the Arabian Peninsula through a combination of diplomacy and military conquest. Today many Islamist or Islamic democratic parties exist in almost every democracy with a Muslim majority. Many militant Islamic groups are also working in different parts of world. The controversial term Islamic fundamentalism has also been coined by some non-Muslims to describe the political and religious philosophies of some militant Islamic groups. Both of these terms, Islamic democracy and Islamic fundamentalism, lump together a large variety of groups with varying histories, ideologies and contexts. Topic: <laughs> Islamic State of Medina The constitution of Medina was drafted by the Islamic prophet Muhammad. It constituted a formal agreement between Muhammad and all of the significant tribes and families of Yathrib later known as Medina, including Muslims, Jews, Christians and pagans. This constitution formed the basis of the first Islamic state. The document was drawn up with the explicit concern of bringing to an end the bitter intertribal fighting between the clans of the Aws and Khazraj within Medina. To this effect it instituted a number of rights and responsibilities for the Muslim, Jewish, Christian and pagan communities of Medina bringing them within the fold of one community. The Ummah, the precise dating of the constitution of Medina remains debated but generally scholars agree it was written shortly after the Hijra It effectively established the first Islamic state. The constitution established, the security of the community, religious freedoms, the role of Medina as a haram or sacred place barring all violence and weapons, the security of women, stable tribal relations within Medina, a tax system for supporting the community in time of conflict, parameters for exogenous political alliances, a system for granting protection of individuals, a judicial system for resolving disputes, and also regulated the paying of blood money the payment between families or tribes for the slaying of an individual in lieu of Lex Talionis. Topic: Early Caliphate and political ideals. After death of Muhammad, his community needed to appoint a new leader, giving rise to the title Caliph, meaning successor. Thus, the subsequent Islamic empires were known as caliphates. Alongside the growth of the Umayyad Empire, the major political development within Islam in this period was the sectarian split between Sunni and Shiite Muslims, this had its roots in a dispute over the succession of the caliphate. Sunni Muslims believed the caliphate was elective, and any Muslim might serve as one. 
Shiites, on the other hand, believed the caliphate should be hereditary in the line of the Prophet, and thus all the caliphs, with the exception of Ali, were usurpers. However, the Sunni sect emerged as triumphant in most of the Muslim world, and thus most modern Islamic political movements with the exception of Iran are founded in Sunni thought. Muhammad's closest companions, the four, rightly guided, Caliphs who succeeded him, continued to expand the state to encompass Jerusalem, Cte Siphon, and Damascus, and sending armies as far as the Sindh. The Islamic Empire stretched from Al-Andalus to the Punjab under the reign of the Umayyad dynasty. The conquering Arab armies took the system of Sharia laws and courts to their new military camps and cities, and built mosques for Friday Jamat community prayers as well as madrasas to educate local Muslim youth. These institutions resulted in the development of a class of ulema, classical Islamic scholars, who could serve as qadis, Sharia court judges, imams of mosques and madrasa teachers. The political terminology of the Islamic state was all the product of this period. Thus, medieval legal terms such as khalifa, sharia, fiqh, madhab, jizya, and dhimmi all remain part of modern Islamic vocabulary. An important Islamic concept concerning the structure of ruling is shura, or consultation with people regarding their affairs, which is the duty of rulers mentioned in two verses in the Quran, 3–153, and 42–36. One type of ruler not part of the Islamic ideal was the king, which was disparaged in Quran's mentions of the pharaoh, the prototype of the unjust and tyrannical ruler, 18–70, and elsewhere, 28–34. Topic. Election or appointment According to a number of scholars and preachers, the concepts of liberalism and democratic participation were already present in the medieval Islamic world. Rashidun Caliphate was an early example of a democratic state but the development of democracy in the Islamic world eventually came to a halt following to the Sunni-Shia split. al Mawardi, a Muslim jurist of the Shafi school, has written that the caliph should be Qureshi. Abu Bakr al bakalani an Ashari Islamic scholar and Maliki lawyer, wrote that the leader of the Muslims simply should be from the majority. Abu Hanifa and Numan, the founder of the Sunni Hanafi school of fiqh, also wrote that the leader must come from the majority. Western scholar of Islam, Fred Donner, argues that the standard Arabian practice during the early caliphates was for the prominent men of a kinship group, or tribe, to gather after a leader's death and elect a leader from amongst themselves, although there was no specified procedure for this shura, or consultative assembly. Candidates were usually from the same lineage as the deceased leader but they were not necessarily his sons. Capable men who would lead well were preferred over an ineffectual direct heir, as there was no basis in the majority Sunni view that the head of state or governor should be chosen based on lineage alone. <laughs> Majlis Ash Shura Deliberations of the caliphates, most notably Rashidun Caliphate were not democratic in the modern sense rather, decision-making power lay with a council of notable and trusted companions of Muhammad and representatives of different tribes most of them selected or elected within their tribes, see also, shura. Traditional Sunni Islamic lawyers agree that shura, loosely translated as consultation of the people, is a function of the caliphate. The Majlis Ash Shura advised the caliph. The importance of this is premised by the following verses of the Quran. Those who answer the call of their Lord and establish the prayer, and who conduct their affairs by shura, are loved by God." 42–38. Consult them the people in their affairs. Then when you have taken a decision from them, put your trust in Allah." 3–159. The majlis is also the means to elect a new caliph. al Mawardi has written that members of the majlis should satisfy three conditions, they must be just, they must have enough knowledge to distinguish a good caliph from a bad one, and must have sufficient wisdom and judgment to select the best caliph. al Mawardi also said in emergencies when there is no caliphate and no majlis, the people themselves should create a majlis, select a list of candidates for caliph, then the majlis should select from the list of candidates. Some modern interpretations of the role of the Majlis Ash Shura include those by Islamist author Sayyid Qutb and by Taqiyuddin al Nabani, the founder of a transnational political movement devoted to the revival of the caliphate. 
In an analysis of the Shura chapter of the Quran, Qutb argued Islam requires only that the ruler consult with at least some of the ruled usually the elite, within the general context of God made laws that the ruler must execute. Taqiyuddin al Nabani writes that Shura is important and part of the ruling structure of the Islamic caliphate, but not one of its pillars, and may be neglected without the caliphate's rule becoming un Islamic. However, these interpretations of shura by Qutb and al Nabani are not universally accepted, and Islamic democrats consider shura to be an integral part and important pillar of Islamic political system. Non-Muslims may serve as members of majlis council of shura, but they cannot become candidates for position of head of Islamic State. Topic: <inaudible> Separation of powers. In the early Islamic caliphate, the head of state, the caliph, had a position based on the notion of a successor to Muhammad's political authority, who, according to Sunnis, were ideally elected by the people or their representatives, as was the case for the election of Abu Bakr, Uthman and Ali as caliph. After the Rashidun caliphs, later caliphates during the Islamic Golden Age had a much lesser degree of democratic participation, but since, "...no one was superior to anyone else except on the basis of piety and virtue." In Islam, and following the example of Muhammad, later Islamic rulers often held public consultations with the people in their affairs. The legislative power of the caliph or later, the sultan was always restricted by the scholarly class, the ulema, a group regarded as the guardians of the law. Since the law came from the legal scholars, this prevented the caliph from dictating legal results. Laws were decided based on the IJMA consensus of the Umma community, which was most often represented by the legal scholars. In order to qualify as a legal scholar, it was required that they obtain a doctorate known as the Ijazat Atadris Wa Liftd, license to teach and issue legal opinions, from a madrasa. In many ways, classical Islamic law functioned like a constitutional law, practically, for hundreds of years after Rashidun Caliphate and until the 20th century, Islamic states followed a system of government based on the coexistence of sultan and ulama following the rules of the sharia. This system resembled to some extent some Western governments in possessing an unwritten constitution like the United Kingdom, and possessing separate, countervailing branches of government like the United States—which provided separation of powers in governance. While the United States and some other systems of government has three branches of government executive legislative and judicial Islamic monarchies had two the sultan and ulama according to Olivier Roy this de facto separation between political power of sultans and emirs and religious power of the caliph was created and institutionalized as early as the end of the 1st century of the Hijra the sovereign's religious function was to defend the Muslim community against its enemies, institute the sharia, ensure the public good The state was instrument to enable Muslims to live as good Muslims and Muslims were to obey the sultan if he did so. The legitimacy of the ruler was, "...symbolized by the right to coin money and to have the Friday prayer said in his name." Sadaqat Qadri argues that a large, "...degree of deference." was shown to the caliphate by the ulama and this was at least at times, "...counterproductive". Although jurists had identified conditions from mental incapacity to blindness that could disqualify a caliph, none had ever dared delineate the powers of the caliphate as an institution." During the Abbasid Caliphate, when Caliph al-Mutawakkil had been killed in 861, jurists had retroactively validated his murder with a fatwa. Eight years later, they had testified to the lawful abdication of a successor, after he had been dragged from a toilet, beaten unconscious, and thrown into a vault to die. By the middle of the 10th century, judges were solemnly confirming that the onset of blindness had disqualified a caliph, without mentioning that they had just been assembled to witness the gouging of his eyes. <laughs> Accountability Sunni Islamic lawyers have commented on when it is permissible to disobey, impeach or remove rulers in the caliphate. This is usually when the rulers are not meeting public responsibilities obliged upon them under Islam. al Mawardi said that if the rulers meet their Islamic responsibilities to the public, the people must obey their laws, but if they become either unjust or severely ineffective then the caliph or ruler must be impeached via the majlis ash-shura. 
Similarly al-Baghdadi believed that if the rulers do not uphold justice, the Ummah via the Majlis should give warning to them, and if unheeded then the Caliph can be impeached. al Juwaini argued that Islam is the goal of the Ummah, so any ruler that deviates from this goal must be impeached. Al-Ghazali believed that oppression by a Caliph is enough for impeachment. Rather than just relying on impeachment, Ibn Hajar al Asqalani obliged rebellion upon the people if the caliph began to act with no regard for Islamic law. Ibn Hajar al Asqalani said that to ignore such a situation is haram, and those who cannot revolt inside the caliphate should launch a struggle from outside. Al Asqalani used two ayahs from the Quran to justify this. And they will say, Our Lord. We obeyed our leaders and our chiefs, and they misled us from the right path. Our Lord. Give them the leaders double the punishment you give us and curse them with a very great curse." 33–67–68 Islamic lawyers commented that when the rulers refuse to step down via successful impeachment through the majlis, becoming dictators through the support of a corrupt army, if the majority agree they have the option to launch a revolution against them. Many noted that this option is only exercised after factoring in the potential cost of life. Topic: <inaudible> Rule of Law. The following hadith establishes the principle of rule of law in relation to nepotism and accountability. Narrated Aisha, the people of Quraysh worried about the lady from Bani Maqsam who had committed theft. They asked, "Who will intercede for her with Allah's apostle?" Some said, "'No one dared to do so except Usama bin Zayd the Beloved One to Allah's Apostle." When Usama spoke about that to Allah's Apostle Allah's Apostle said, "'Do you try to intercede for somebody in a case connected with Allah's prescribed punishments?' Then he got up and delivered a sermon saying, "'What destroyed the nations preceding you, was that if a noble amongst them stole, they would forgive him, and if a poor person amongst them stole, they would inflict Allah's legal punishment on him. By Allah, if Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad my daughter, stole, I would cut off her hand." Various Islamic lawyers do however place multiple conditions, and stipulations e.g. the poor cannot be penalized for stealing out of poverty, before executing such a law, making it very difficult to reach such a stage. It is well known during a time of drought in the Rashidun Caliphate period, capital punishments were suspended until the effects of the drought passed. Islamic jurists later formulated the concept of the rule of law, the equal subjection of all classes to the ordinary law of the land, where no person is above the law and where officials and private citizens are under a duty to obey the same law. A Qadi Islamic judge was also not allowed to discriminate on the grounds of religion, race, color, kinship, or prejudice. There were also a number of cases where caliphs had to appear before judges as they prepared to take their verdict. According to Noah Feldman, a law professor at Harvard University, the legal scholars and jurists who once upheld the rule of law were replaced by a law governed by the state due to the codification of sharia by the Ottoman Empire in the early 19th century. How the scholars lost their exalted status as keepers of the law is a complex story, but it can be summed up in the adage that partial reforms are sometimes worse than none at all. In the early 19th century, the Ottoman Empire responded to military setbacks with an internal reform movement. The most important reform was the attempt to codify sharia. This westernizing process, foreign to the Islamic legal tradition, sought to transform sharia from a body of doctrines and principles to be discovered by the human efforts of the scholars into a set of rules that could be looked up in a book. Once the law existed in codified form, however, the law itself was able to replace the scholars as the source of authority. Codification took from the scholars their all-important claim to have the final say over the content of the law and transferred that power to the state. <inaudible> Obedience and opposition According to scholar Mujan Momin, "...one of the key statements in the Quran around which much of the exegesis on the issue of what Islamic doctrine says about who is in charge is based on the verse, O believers. Obey God and obey the Apostle and those who have been given authority among you Quran For Sunnis, Uulaa al-Amr are the rulers caliphs and kings, but for Shi'is this expression refers to the Imams. According to scholar Bernard Lewis, this Quranic verse has been 
elaborated in a number of sayings attributed to Muhammad. But there are also sayings that put strict limits on the duty of obedience. Two dicta attributed to the Prophet and universally accepted as authentic are indicative. One says, "...there is no obedience in sin." In other words, if the ruler orders something contrary to the divine law, not only is there no duty of obedience, but there is a duty of disobedience. This is more than the right of revolution that appears in Western political thought. It is a duty of revolution, or at least of disobedience and opposition to authority. The other pronouncement, "...do not obey a creature against his creator," again clearly limits the authority of the ruler, whatever form of ruler that may be. However, Ibn Taymiyyah, an important 14th-century scholar of the Hanbali school, says in Tafsir for this verse, "...there is no obedience in sin." that people should ignore the order of the ruler if it would disobey the divine law and shouldn't use this as excuse for revolution because it will spell Muslims' bloods. According to Ibn Taymiyyah, the saying, 60 years with an unjust imam is better than one night without a sultan backquote, was confirmed by experience, he believed that the Quranic injunction to "...enjoin good and forbid evil." Al Amr by El Maruf wa en Nahi ani El Munkar, found in Quran 3 104 and Quran 3 110 and other verses, was the duty of every state functionary with charge over other Muslims from the caliph to the schoolmaster in charge of assessing children's handwriting exercises. <laughs> Shia tradition In Shia Islam, three attitudes towards rulers predominated political cooperation with the ruler, political activism challenging the ruler, and aloofness from politics with writings of Shia ulama through the ages showing elements of all three of these attitudes. <laughs> Khawarij tradition political extremist. Extremism within Islam goes back to the 7th century to the Qarijites. From their essentially political position, they developed extreme doctrines that set them apart from both mainstream Sunni and Shia Muslims. The Qarijites were particularly noted for adopting a radical approach to takfir, whereby they declared other Muslims to be unbelievers and therefore deemed them worthy of death. <laughs> Modern era Topic. Reaction to European colonialism In the 19th century, European colonization of the Muslim world coincided with the retreat of the Ottoman Empire, the French conquest of Algeria 1830, the disappearance of the Mughal Empire in India 1857, the Russian incursions into the Caucasus 1828, and Central Asia. The first Muslim reaction to European colonization was of peasant and religious not urban origin, charismatic leaders, generally members of the ulama or leaders of religious orders, launched the call for jihad and formed tribal coalitions. Sharia in defiance of local common law was imposed to unify tribes. Examples include Abd al-Qadir in Algeria, the Mahdi in Sudan, Shamil in the Caucasus, the Senussi in Libya and in Chad, Mullah i Lang in Afghanistan, the Akhand of Swat in India, and later, Abd al-Karim in Morocco. All these movements eventually failed, despite spectacular victories such as the destruction of the British Army in Afghanistan in 1842 and the taking of Karum in 1885. The second Muslim reaction to European encroachment later in the century and early 20th century was not violent resistance but the adoption of some Western political, social, cultural, and technological ways. Members of the urban elite, particularly in Egypt, Iran, and Turkey advocated and practiced «westernization». The failure of the attempts at political westernization, according to some, was exemplified by the Tanzimat reorganization of the Ottoman rulers. Sharia was codified into law which was called the Misel, and an elected legislature was established to make law. These steps took away the ulama's role of «discovering». The law and the formerly powerful scholar class weakened and withered into religious functionaries, while the legislature was suspended less than a year after its inauguration and never recovered to replace the ulama as a separate branch of government providing separation of powers. The 
paradigm of the executive as a force unchecked by either the sharia of the scholars or the popular authority of an elected legislature became the dominant paradigm in most of the Sunni Muslim world in the 20th century. <laughs> Modern political ideal of the Islamic State In addition to the legitimacy given by medieval scholarly opinion, nostalgia for the days of successful Islamic empire simmered under later Western colonialism. This nostalgia played a major role in the Islamist political ideal of Islamic State, a state in which Islamic law is preeminent. The Islamist political program is generally to be accomplished by reshaping the governments of existing Muslim nation-states, but the means of doing this varies greatly across movements and circumstances. Many democratic Islamist movements, such as the Jamaat-e-Islami and Muslim Brotherhood have used the democratic process and focus on votes and coalition building with other political parties. Radical movements such as Taliban and Al-Qaeda embrace militant Islamic ideology. Al-Qaeda was prominent for being part of the anti-Soviet resistance in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Both of the aforementioned groups had a role to play with the September 11 attacks in 2001, presenting both near and far enemies as regional governments and the United States respectively. They also took part in the bombings in Madrid in 2004 and London in 2005. The recruits often came from the ranks of jihadis, from Egypt, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, and Morocco. 20th and 21st century Following World War I and the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, and the subsequent dissolution of the Caliphate by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk founder of Turkey, many Muslims perceived that the political power of their religion was in retreat. There was also concern that Western ideas and influence were spreading throughout Muslim societies. This led to considerable resentment of the influence of the European powers. The Muslim Brotherhood was created in Egypt as a movement to resist and harry the British. During the 1960s, the predominant ideology within the Arab world was pan-Arabism which de-emphasized religion and emphasized the creation of socialist, secular states based on Arab nationalism rather than Islam. However, governments based on Arab nationalism have found themselves facing economic stagnation and disorder. Increasingly, the borders of these states were seen as artificial colonial creations, which they were, having literally been drawn on a map by European colonial powers. Topic. Contemporary movements Some common political currents in Islam include Traditionalism, which accepts traditional commentaries on the Quran and Sunnah and «takes as its basic principle imitation to clid, that is, refusal to innovate» and follows one of the four legal schools or madhab Shafi, Maliki, Hanafi, Hanbali and, may include Sufism. An example of Sufi traditionalism is the Barelvi school in Pakistan. Fundamentalist reformism, which "...criticizes the tradition, the commentaries, popular religious practices the cult of saints," deviations, and superstitions, it aims to return to the founding texts. This reformism generally developed in response to an external threat the influence of Hinduism on Islam, for example, 18th-century examples are Shah Wali Allah in India and Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab in the Arabian Peninsula. Salafism is a modern example. Islamism or political Islam, embracing a return to the sharia or Islamic principles, but adopting Western terminology such as revolution, ideology, politics and democracy and taking a more liberal attitude towards issues like jihad and women's rights. Contemporary examples include the Jamaat-e-Islami, Muslim Brotherhood, Iranian Islamic Revolution, Masayumi Party, United Malays National Organization, Pan-Malaysian Islamic Party and Justice and Development Party Turkey. Liberal movements within Islam generally define themselves in opposition to Islamic political movements, but often embrace many of its anti-imperialist and Islam-inspired liberal reformist elements. <laughs> Sunni and Shia differences According to scholar Vali Nasser, political tendencies of Sunni and Shia Islamic ideology differ, with Sunni Islamic revivalism in Pakistan and much of the Arab world being, "...far from politically revolutionary", 
While Shia political Islam is strongly influenced by Ruhollah Khomeini and his talk of the oppression of the poor and class war. Sunni revivalism is rooted in conservative religious impulses and the bazaars, mixing mercantile interests with religious values. Khomeini's version of Islamism engaged the poor and spoke of class war. This cleavage between fundamentalism as revivalism and fundamentalism as revolution was deep and for a long while coincided closely with the sectarian divide between the Sunnis. The Muslim world's traditional haves concerned more with conservative religiosity, and the Shia, the longtime outsiders, more drawn to radical dreaming and scheming. Graham Fuller has also noted that he found no mainstream Islamist organization with the exception of Shia Iran with radical social views or a revolutionary approach to the social order apart from the imposition of legal justice. Topic see also Islamism Islamic democracy Islam and secularism Political philosophy of Islamic Golden Age Islamic revival Jihadism Islamic peace Islam and war List of Islamic democratic political parties Modern Islamic philosophy International propagation of conservative Sunni Islam post Islamism topic notes topic references topic sources the following sources generally prescribe to the theory that there is a distinct 20th century movement called Islamism Children of Abraham an introduction to Islam for Jews Khalid Duran with Abdel Wahab Hekij The American Jewish Committee and KTAV 2001 The Islamism Debate Martin Kramer 1997 which includes the chapter The Mismeasure of Political Islam Liberal Islam a source book Charles Kurzman Oxford University University Press, 1998 The Challenge of Fundamentalism, Political Islam and the New World Disorder, Bassam Tibi, Univ, of California Press, 1998 The following sources challenge the notion of an «Islamist movement», Edward Said, Orientalism Merrill Wynne Davies, Beyond Frontiers, Islam and Contemporary Needs G. H. Jansen, Militant Islam, 1980 Hamid Enyat, Modern Islamic Political Thought These authors in general locate the issues of Islamic political intolerance and fanaticism not in Islam, but in the generally low level of awareness of Islam's own mechanisms for dealing with these, among modern believers, in part a result of Islam being suppressed prior to modern times. Topic further reading on democracy in the Middle East, the role of Islamist political parties and the war on terrorism, Ayub, Muhammad. The Many Faces of Political Islam, Religion and Politics in the Muslim World. University of Michigan Press, 2007. Marina Ottoway, et al., Democratic Mirage in the Middle East, Carnegie Endowment for Ethics and International Peace, Policy Brief 20, October 20, 2002. Marina Ottoway and Thomas Carruthers, Think Again, Middle East Democracy, Foreign Policy November, December 2004. Stephen Wright, The United States and Persian Gulf Security, The Foundations of the War on Terror, Ithaca Press, 2007 ISBN 978 0 321 6 Adnan M. Hayogne, The U.S. Strategy, Democracy and Internal Stability in the Arab World, Alternatives Vol. 3, No. 2 and 3, Summer, Fall 2004. Gary Gamble, Jumpstarting Arab Reform, The Bush Administration's Greater Middle East Initiative, Middle East Intelligence Bulletin Vol. 6, No. 6–7, June, July 2004. Remarks by the President at the 20th Anniversary of the National Endowment for Democracy, United States Chamber of Commerce, Washington, D.C. President Bush discusses freedom in Iraq and Middle East, 6 November 2003. Robert Blecker, Free People Will Set the Course of History, Intellectuals, Democracy and American Empire, Middle East Report March 2003. Robert Fisk, What Does Democracy Really Mean in the Middle East? Whatever the West Decides, The Independent, 8 August 2005. Fawaz Gurges, Is Democracy in the Middle East a Pipe Dream? Yale Global Online, April 25, 2005. Masood Ashraf Raja. Muslim Modernity, Poetics, Politics, and Metaphysics, Muslim Societies and the Challenge of Secularization, an Interdisciplinary Approach. Gabriele Maranci. Ed. Aberdeen, Springer, 2010–99–112. External links Islam and Politics from the Dean Peter Krogh Foreign Affairs Digital Archives Liberal Democracy and Political Islam, The Search for Common Ground The Ideology of Terrorism and Violence in Saudi Arabia, Origins, Reasons and Solution 
Evaluating the Islamist Movement by Greg Noakes, an American Muslim who works at The Washington Report Muslim scholars face down fanaticism by Aicha Lemzine, an Algerian journalist and author. Peter Krog dissesses Islam and politics with John L. Esposito and Mary Jane Deeb on Great Decisions 1994.